All right. Well, we are uh, preaching another message this morning. Last week, I, I preached a message called Take a Seat. And this morning, I, I titled my message, Sit, Walk, Stand. Now, to be clear, I want you to know, because you may already know this, and if you don't, maybe somebody that might watch the video would know, that this is actually the title of a book that was written by a Chinese preacher named Watchman Nee many, many, many years ago. I read the book. I don't remember exactly what all the book was about, but it was mostly like on the book of Ephesians. It was a breakdown of the book of Ephesians. And basically, that's kind of what I'm preaching this morning out of the book of Ephesians on these three concepts called sit, walk, stand. So I figured that would at least be a good title. All three of these action words, uh, sit, walk, stand, are extremely important in reference to the way God's people live their lives. Amen. It could be said that sitting is synonymous to trusting and resting in God. Trusting His power, trusting His wisdom, trusting His plan. Even in the psalm that we just heard, what we see is, is that through all of that, all of the tragedy, all of the things that that man had to endure, the loss of family members, the loss of his estate, the loss of his home, the loss of so many different things, he was trusting in the midst of it all, God's plan, God's wisdom. And I guarantee you to write that song in the middle of all that, trusting in God's power to get him through. So sitting, in a sense, as we're going to break it down, is synonymous with that. It's synonymous with resting in God. Resting in God and trusting in God. to That his power and that his wisdom and that his plan, amen, are going to get us through. Praise God. You know, there's an ongoing theme in the Old and the New Testaments where God's people repeatedly struggle with this. God's people throughout the ages have struggled with trusting and resting in God and His power and His plan. You know, Moses, this morning we have a lot of people that know a pretty good little bit about the Bible. Um, I'll try to explain and we'll just act like we don't know a whole lot about the Bible. How's that sound? But I don't feel like I have to overly explain some things, but... You know, when I make references to people, hopefully some of us have read the stories and we're somewhat familiar with it. If not, if you've been coming to church here for any length of time, I probably told you the story, so you should be familiar with it. But, you know, struggling with trusting and resting in God. Moses, he struggled with trusting and resting in God. And the reason why is he killed an Egyptian. Moses killed an Egyptian. Jacob deceived his father Isaac, right? Then Peter went back to a life of fishing. Moses specifically, God had said that he was going to use Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. But there was a day that he happened to be out there and he heard two, uh, he heard an Egyptian and a Hebrew quarreling with one another. And Moses thinking, hey man, God's got a plan for my life. I'm not saying he thought all this through. But his result was he didn't like the way the Egyptian was treating the Hebrew man. And Moses was a Hebrew man, even though he had grown up in Pharaoh's house. And he, and he ended up killing that Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. See, what I'm trying to say is, is God had a plan for Moses' life, but he struggled with trusting God's plan, God's way of, of going about it. And instead, he took matters into his own hands and he killed this Egyptian and he stepped outside of God's will. And same thing with Jacob. Whenever God had a plan for Jacob's life, that it was going to be through Jacob's descendants that Jesus would ultimately come and that the plan would come. But Jacob got hasty, he and his mother, and he deceived his father into tricking him into giving him the birthright. And Peter, you know, Jesus told the disciples, he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. But Peter, the Bible in the Greek, when you read it in the Greek, according to one Greek scholar named Kenneth Weist, when Peter said, I go a fishing, it wasn't just a little casual fishing trip. He was going back to his former way of life. He was turning his back on being a fisher of men. He was throwing in the towel. He, he was at a very, very critical time in the, in the time frame of the gospel. And all the other disciples said, and we go with you. So there's an there's a ongoing theme where God's people have a hard time sitting, sitting, resting, and trusting. And walking, regarding the word walk, is the journey traveled for the believer. You know, while the believer trusts and rests in God, he also has to walk for God. God places each individual, every last one of us that belong to him in a specific place. He puts us in a specific place. Why? So that we can walk out our lives in a way that brings him glory. 
I wish there would have been more people here this morning that wouldn't have missed just because of the, I guess the time change, either that or I preached too long last week, but uh, whatever the reason, because there's people in our church that have been coming that need to hear the fact that God has called people to walk for him and he puts us in specific places. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, is that your life journey along with the will of God for your life, will put you in specific places and give you the opportunity to walk out your life in such a way that it would bring God glory. Yeah, I used a couple more examples that Moses walked out the majority of his life, a lot of it in Egypt, but also in the wilderness with the children of Israel. Here are a couple more examples, Elijah and Elisha, after the kingdom was split, they did their prophesying and they did their walking for God in the northern part of the kingdom. Daniel was from Judah. He was down there near Jerusalem in the southern part of the kingdom. And guess what? He was deported whenever Nebuchadnezzar came and he was drug all the way to Babylon. That's where he walked out his life for God. And Joseph ended up in Egypt and walked out his life for God in Egypt. Now, many of these people were living in the midst of perilous times. And many times, untoward or negative circumstances caused them to be where they were, where God asked them to walk out their lives for him. Even in the psalm that was saying this morning, this man faced perilous times and he ended up wherever he was. He might have been in the same place that he always was, but it put him in a different context, in a different atmosphere, where he was asked by God to walk out his life. God puts people in a certain place in their life to walk out on this journey on earth for a purpose to bring him glory. Standing speaks of the separated life of the people of God. The reason that the believer must learn to sit is because without God's help, he will never make it in this world. The reason he must learn to walk, now this is, I think this is good, the reason he must learn to walk is because God's whole purpose for creating his whole family is that the world will know who he is. Newsflash, it's not all about us. You know what I'm saying? Many times we get so caught up in our own life and our own circumstances, and we're so, you know, the word is egocentric, centered around self, that we all we see is ourself and our situation. But the reality of it is, is this, is that God's whole purpose in making the plan of redemption and making the plan of salvation is so that he could create a family for himself and that his family Amen. Would live for him on this earth and bring glory to him. Shine a light on God. Why? Because the world is in the middle of darkness. And if there's not a people of light that shine, the that shine light on God to reveal his glory in the midst of darkness to a lost and a dying world, then they'll never have the opportunity to know about God to begin with. And that's God's whole plan is that people would come to a place to know him. Amen. And that's why he created the family. That's why he created his family. He put both the need to sit and the requirement to walk. But I'm sorry, both the need to sit and the requirement to walk. Tell the story that there's opposition that the man, that the child of God must stand against opposition out there. And the darkness is here for a reason. The presence of evil is here, and therefore the child of God must learn to stand. Mm -hmm. Joseph stood against the sin that Potiphar's wife offered. Daniel stood against a government that told him he could no longer pray anymore, and he was thrown into a lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood against a government that wanted them to bow down to false gods. What is the opposition and the evil of this world trying to get you to not take a stand for, to trying to get you to bow down for. That's that sit, walk, and stand is, is what we're talking about. And the book of Ephesians equips the New Testament believer to sit, walk, and stand for God. And I put down here, during the final chapter are the last days of God's people on earth. I believe that with all of my heart. How long the last days last, I don't know, but they started whenever Jesus showed up. Yeah. Jesus inaugurated the last days. The day of Pentecost allowed the birth of the church 
to take place or the inception of the church, however you want to look at it, to take place. And there's going to be a day whenever it will come to its finality. But the reality of it is, is that until the church age is finished, we are in the last days and we see ourselves getting closer and closer. And the Bible warns us and gives us clues on what it's going to look like the closer we get to the end. We talked about it last week. In the end days, the Spirit expressly says that in the end days, some will depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That means that people would literally turn their back on the truth of the gospel while at the same time they embrace a false gospel and they think that they're still in the gospel. Lord, help us. Yes. I mean, if you can't see that happening in the church today... He says that in, that in the end days, they're going to call good evil and evil good. Is that not happening right now as we live? Come on, somebody, help me out here. At least according to what the Bible teaches as good versus evil, the world out there is in opposition to what the Bible teaches. And so what I'm trying to say is in this message this morning, the book of Ephesians is going to equip the New Testament believer to sit, walk, and stand for God. That brings me to point number one, seated with Christ. We mentioned earlier that seated spoke in some way to the idea of trusting or resting. You can put Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 up there. I didn't know for sure if I was going to go to that particular scripture. But we're talking about seated or resting, trusting God. You know, many times whenever you're walking out this, this journey and whenever you're living for the Lord, sometimes we have a heart. We're, we're over here working. We're over here attempting to get through, to muscle through. Right. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out ways to make things happen. And the reality of it is, is let me tell you something. One of the things that you will realize and learn and many times we'll learn it the hard way is that whenever we find ourselves what Jesus is describing in this scripture, we find ourselves weary and, and, and burdened because we've been laboring. Because we like Martha instead of like Mary in the New Testament, that Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and Martha was encumbered, meaning she was carrying a load. She was worn down with many things because she allowed herself to be worried about with many things. And she was scurrying and trying to fix stuff and nothing was going right. She was stressed out over it and she's still trying to fix stuff in her own strength. The Lord said, come unto me, you that are that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will find rest for your weary souls. Listen to me. Sometimes you're going to find yourself so weary in this life because we're trying to fix things and we're doing the opposite of learning how to sit in Christ. We're doing the opposite of learning how to rest in Christ. We're doing the opposite of learning how to trust God. And instead we're taking matters in our own hands and trying to remedy our own situation. And when you do that, there's a lack of peace in your life. There's a lack of grace in your life. Why? Because God's not going to honor that. Why won't God? Come on, God, just honor what I'm doing. No, because if I honor what you're doing, you're going to think that this is the right way. And my word says you must learn how to sit. I provided the right way for you. I need you to learn how to sit in the way that I provided for you, which is Christ. You've got to learn how to sit in Christ. Amen. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. Seated with Christ. He says, even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. I love that idea. You know, the old King James language of quickened literally means to be brought to life. Hallelujah. You were dead and now you're alive. Praise God. That's what the word means. Quick to be brought to life. Amen. And, and what I want you to know, though, is this, is that in that scripture, it says he quickened us together. That means that there's a there's like a, it's like a marriage. It's a union that God allowed you and I to be connected to Jesus through faith. Hallelujah. The old man that was born dead in sin in Adam has now been united with Jesus in his death. And now he can be brought together. He quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. He raised us up together. He made us sit together in heavenly places. Hallelujah. What I need you to know this morning is the first point is, is that we're seated with Christ. And the way that this happened was that when you were exposed to the gospel, 
Amen. And you believed in Christ Jesus. When you believed the word, then there, then God allowed your faith to be mixed with his gospel. And he allowed you, the old man that you were, to die and to be connected with Jesus. Now you're not just connected to the death of the old man, but you're also connected to the resurrection life oh, of the oh, new man. Amen. amen. First and foremost, to be seated with Jesus describes the fact that we have been made one with him. Before faith in Jesus, we were dead in sin, but just as he died on the cross for our sin, we died with him to the power of sin. That's the gospel. Sometimes we don't always experience it the way that we want to in our lives. Sometimes there's a struggle and there's something going on in the midst of our lives and we don't understand why we're not experiencing the things that the gospel says. But I'm here to tell you, and I, I was sharing with somebody here recently and I've told it to the church many a times because God has to keep reminding it to me about myself that if there's a problem, the problem isn't with the gospel and the problem isn't with Jesus. The problem Amen. is with Matthew. Amen. The problem is with us. Yes. The gospel yes. works. Jesus' work is a finished and a completed work. Amen. Right. Many times the truth is, is, truth be told, and listen, anytime I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to the preacher. Many times we don't want to let go. We don't want to, we don't want to sit, but let me not get a hold of myself, ahead of myself. The death we experienced produced life in us. We died with him. We're buried with him. We've been resurrected with him. And now as far as God is concerned, we're seated with him in the heavenly realm. Amen. Look at that. The victory is secure. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And in God's mind, we're seated in him in heavenly places. <clears throat> Praise God. Here's some thoughts to sit and rest in. Some more scriptures out of Ephesians for you to think about and what you can rest in. Amen. Because like I said, to this morning's message is titled Sit, Walk, Stand. And we're, we're on point number one, seated with Christ. And, but I wanted you to see some scriptures that talk about sitting or resting and some things you can rest in. Look at this. Ephesians 1 verse 5. It says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That's a whole lot of Bible terminology there. We got to break that down a little bit. You can sit and rest in the fact that you are a child of God. Hallelujah. You might have been born in sin, separated from God as a child of Adam, but you've been born again and adopted into the family of God. What won't a father do for his child? Listen, you know, I wish that there was some more people in here that wasn't just like didn't know so much about Christianity right now. <laughs> You, you, the reason that I say that is, is because sometimes whenever we've been in the church for so long, we start taking things for granted. That's right. That's right. People that hadn't really been in the church very long, they don't really understand a whole lot. They don't understand what it means to be a child of Adam necessarily. They don't understand what it means to be born into sin and to be enculturated by the world. But every last one of us has a history that we can connect ourselves to, that we can remember. Sometimes people are raised in the church and that's their culture. The things of God. And many times I don't believe that we understand what a blessing that actually is. It doesn't mean that we're not going to go through some things and we're not going to have to find God for ourselves. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that many times people that whenever they're born in the world, that's all they know. That's all they know. They were, they've been enculturated by a world system. You can think about your own family. You can think about your own father. And I know I talk about this a lot, but it's legit. I mean, it's a legitimate thing to think about. You can think about the, the way that you were raised. You know, I, I think about the way my dad was and the way his family was and how there was all these got boys and how they wanted to drink and fight. And, and then that was an element that I was raised into and, and I was enculturated into that ways of thinking of the world. But what I'm here to tell you is that God had a plan. It was a plan that was predestinated, foreordained in advance. And the plan was that he was going to send his son, Jesus, yes. and that Jesus was going to allow his righteousness to die on a cross. And that whenever a believer would put faith in that, then a great exchange would take place where you give him your sin and he takes it and he gives you his righteousness. And now the spirit of God comes to live on the inside of you and you become a child of the king, a child of the living God. It's a new family that you're part of now. Amen. A new family with a new way of living. Amen. Amen. You can sit and rest in the fact that you are a child of God. 
Hallelujah. But, but listen, you might have been born separated in sin of your father Adam and his, his son Seth, uh, you know, Seth and his son, this all the way down to his son Jim Abair, and which was my daddy's name, and, and his son Matt Abair. I, I, that's how it goes. That's who your father is. Your father's ultimately Adam. You were born of sin, but hallelujah, you got a new father. Yes. You've been born again from the dead. You, you can rest in the fact that you're a child of God. You've been born again and adopted to the family of God. Amen. There's another thing you can rest in. Ephesians 1 verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He has made us accepted in the beloved. Oh man, I love that word beloved. <laughs> you know what it means? It means one that is dearly loved. Man, I can remember some of these. There's a couple of different scriptures where, where Jesus was being baptized and the Father spoke from heaven. He said, this is my son. In him, I am well pleased. I don't know how God speaks to you, but the first time I read that after the Lord started showing me some stuff, he said, you know what that means, son? I'm not real well pleased with you. Now, he may not talk to you that way, but he talks to me that way. I'm not real well pleased with you, but I'm so pleased with him. Because he always did what I wanted him to do. But I can be well pleased with you if you be found in him. Hallelujah. Not if you do everything right, because you're not going to do everything right. That is not the deal that God is making. And anybody that turns around and regurgitates something that they learn from another man that stood behind a pulpit or whatever the case and thinks that it's all about your actions and you getting it right all the time, you're missing the point. That's why Jesus had to come to earth in his perfection and his sinlessness and offer himself up as a sacrifice because you and I couldn't get her done. You are accepted in the dearly loved one. You're in him. You're seated in him. And because you're in him and the father sees you in him, hallelujah, he can be pleased with you. This is my son. Hear him. I am well pleased with him. He's the beloved one. And good news, good news. If you're saved this morning, I didn't ask you where you are in your walk. I'm asking you either saved or you're not. If you're saved this morning... Good news, because you're in the beloved one. And if you're in the beloved one, then the Father can love you. Amen? Quit letting Satan make you feel unworthy when the Word of God says that the Father accepts you because of your seated position in the beloved. Now, here's another thing you can rest in right here, Ephesians 1, 7. You can sit in this. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That word redemption means a purchase price. You can sit rested in the fact that you're no longer a slave of sin. You were purchased off the slave market of sin and the ransom price was the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. See, in your first birth of Adam, you didn't have a choice. You were born of Adam. You were born in sin. Sin had a legal right to hold you down. Sin had a legal right to empower you, to, to make you a slave, and to tell you where it wanted you to go. But the reality of it is, is that that's not the case anymore. I'm telling you what the Word of God says this morning. The Word of God says this morning that the purchase price was paid. The ransom was paid. You've been bought off the slave market of sin. You're no longer a slave to sin. Paul said, I'm a do loss of the Lord Jesus Christ, a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, the reality of it is, is that sometimes we don't want to let go of our slavery. Sometimes we don't want to submit, but that's another story for another time. We'll get to that in a second. Let's look at this. Another thing that we can rest in. Last thing that we can rest or sit in. I mean, there was about five more that I had to get that I had to get rid of because I, I said I'll never get rid of finish with this message if I keep going. But the, but the first couple of chapters of Ephesians is full of things that you and I can sit in, can rest in, that we have access to because we're seated in Christ. Look at this. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom, that's talking about Jesus, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, amen, the good news about Jesus. <clears throat> Whenever you think back, well, let, me, let me not get ahead of myself. The gospel of your salvation in whom also after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Do you remember the day that you actually got saved? <clears throat> 
You should, you should be able to remember the day that you actually, when you really, really got saved. I'm not talking about, listen, I'm not talking about you was in vacation Bible school and you might have raised your hand one day. I'm not, that could have been the day that you got saved. I'm not saying that wasn't the day you got saved. I'm not trying to say the first time you ever prayed a prayer. If you're truly saved, you should remember. Everybody doesn't have an experience like Robert did. You know, Robert told me, he gave me permission a long time ago, I could use his testimony. So when Robert was in prison, he got saved one night. He had a, he had a roommate who now he's in business with. Very, very, very blessed business. Amen. Been a pillar in the community as far as I'm concerned for many years. Right. But but this is the point. When Robert was in prison, his 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 celly told him the, the, the good news about Jesus Christ. And he kind of went and, he, you know, rejected for a little while. But then one night, I think it was the night before Resurrection Sunday. Right. He was I don't know if he prayed or whatever the case, but he said his whole body, <laughs> the way he describes it, was like a sleeping foot, like a tingling sensation. Not everybody experiences that. But let me tell you something. If you truly get saved, you might not have even felt it right there at that moment in time. But at some point in time, you should have felt something different. You know why? Because the weight of guilt was taken off of you. You should have felt some type of some type of relief, some type of burden lifted, something different. Where all of a sudden now, the Holy Spirit's speaking much more clearly to you and he's showing you things like, listen, when I first got saved, I didn't even, nobody even had to tell me the stuff I was doing was wrong. I wrote a letter to my little sister and I told her all the stuff she was doing wrong. And the crazy thing was, is she said, well, you're in trouble then, boy, because you you was doing every last one of them things. All of a sudden, I just knew. Nobody even had to specifically read it to me out of the Bible. The Holy Spirit will reveal Amen. The truth of God's word to you. So that's what it means to be sealed with the spirit. When you heard the gospel and you believed by faith and you were sealed with the spirit of promise, it says that was the earnest or the down payment of your inheritance. That's just the down payment. If you're really saved this morning and you felt the burden lifted and you know that you know, like Sister Toot used to say, that you know, that you know, that you know that you're saved. Hallelujah. That's just the down payment. There's more to come. There's coming a day whenever the redemption of the body of the saints is going to be fulfilled. What does that mean? That the final, the purchase price will, the the transaction will be finalized and you and I will be resurrected from the dead. Hallelujah. And we will receive a glorified body just like the one who is the firstborn from the resurrection. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. The rest of the harvest is coming and we're going to receive a glorified body. Hallelujah. Just like him. But when you got saved and you received the earnest, the down payment, it meant the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you. And if the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you, guess what? Good news. Good news. Good news. You can rest and you can sit in the fact. Hallelujah. That you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It was an instantaneous miracle. An instantaneous miracle. Amen. That when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart. So many things were happening in the spiritual realm, but it all happened in one moment in time, almost like in the twinkling of an eye. Listen to me. So much happened in that one moment when you just said, yes, you didn't have to. We didn't have to move your lips. You just from from the hearing of the gospel to the stimulation of your brain when it touched your heart and your heart said, yes. Immediately, so many That's things it. happened in the oh, spiritual God. realm. Oh, man. Your guilt was removed. His righteousness was given to you as a gift. And the Holy Spirit sealed you and came to live on the inside of you. All that stuff just happened. And at the snap, I mean, the faster than the twinkling of an eye. That's the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Did you feel it? I wrote that in here. I put a question mark. Did you feel it? Did you feel it when you got saved? Did you did you feel it whenever the burden was lifted? You know, there's going to be a day when there will be no more tears. You ever felt any pain on this earth, man? If y'all if y'all wasn't here, if y'all came in late, I got to tell you, y'all missed it, man. Chari sang a special <laughs> on the piano. And I'm going to tell you right now, it was a song about all is well with my soul. And it's the message that she spoke about it. The story behind the song. The guy had lost everything. I think it was back in 1887 or something like that. Lost family, lost his family in a shipwreck. The wife sent a telegram that said, uh, 
all lost but me or something to that effect. I, 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 save the loan. Save the loan. She was the only one saved. His children lost. C comes home and not long after that and his whole estate caught on fire. The bank told him, oh, no, we, the insurance company said we can't reimburse you because it was an act of God. Lost everything. And he ends up writing this song. All is well with my soul. You know, there's going to be a day when there will be no more tears and no more crying and no more pain. How, how the child of God will long to see that day, huh? But I got to tell you something. Until that day comes, stay seated in Christ. Stay seated in Christ. Access his power so you can walk and stand for him. We've already said it. Listen, to be seated in Christ, we have to learn how to be seated in Christ because in order to, we need the power of God if we're going to walk for him. If you missed the introduction, listen, sit, walk, stand. We got to learn how to be seated in Christ so we can receive the power that we need in order to walk for God because God is placing people in specific places in their lives. How did you end up where you are? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, do you ever think about your life? Mama was born in Lake Arthur. Daddy was born in Baton Rouge. And somehow I ended up wherever I am in the places that I've been. And the journey that has taken me. What's your story? How did you end up where you are? I don't know. But listen, God, God put you in a specific place and he wants you to walk for him. Because there's a journey. Joseph ended up in Egypt, but God wanted him to walk for him. Because, because we're living in the midst of darkness. And God put his light on the inside of you. And if you don't let your light reflect his light, then the darkened world will never know that he even exists. And that he's got a plan, hallelujah, a plan where you can become the adopted of God, where you can become the child of God, where you can have eternal life. That brings me to my next point. Walk with him, walk for him, sit, walk, stand. Now we're walking, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. That word vocation, it's not vacation, it's vocation. And it's, you know, many times we use the terminology vocation to describe a career or a job today. The idea though here in the Greek is it's an invitation or a calling. You know, the truth is, is that if you think back to the time whenever you gave your heart to the Lord, somebody probably invited you to church. It's a possibility, right? I mean, I'm not saying you got saved in the church. I, that's one of the things that I really feel like is different, supposed to be different about this church. For instance, a while back, I was preaching on a Wednesday night, and there was, and, and I was preaching pretty hard, and I was talking about, I mean, when I say preaching hard, preaching the gospel, hammering the gospel, talking about various things, sin and salvation, whatever the case, and all of a sudden, Robert got a phone call from somebody that he knew, and, they, and, and they, I didn't even do an altar call that night, and I'm not ashamed of that. I'll look in the camera and say, I'm not ashamed of that. Let me tell you why. Because that person called up Robert and said, I don't think that I'm right. I don't think that I'm saved. I think I need Jesus, and guess what? Robert let him through the prayer of salvation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that more than likely, Robert had already previously invited those people to church. That's not the invitation we're talking about. I mean, that's part of it. That's part of the invitation. But when we're talking about an invitation to the vocation, what we're talking about right here is the calling of God upon your heart. See, you were invited by God, called by God to become part of his family, to become a child of God. If you're saved, you were invited by God's spirit. When you heard the gospel and you believed and you were saved, you became a child of God. You don't have to turn there, but in John 6, Jesus said, no man comes to me except the Father first draws him. The Holy Spirit of God draws a man towards Jesus. But then Jesus says that I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And now, and now he's asking us to represent him on this earth. After you received the invitation, after you received the vocation, after you submitted to the calling... And now he's asking you to live for him on this earth as you walk out your journey. 
Listen, just as if you bear the name A Bear, Fernandez, or Bill Yacht, you represent a certain group of people. When you bear the name Christian, you represent God on earth, and He asks us to walk worthy. He said that. That's what it said in Ephesians 4 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling. Jesus is the only one that can make us worthy. But at some point in time, and I'm telling you, this is just as much for the preacher as it is for the people that sit in the pew. At some point in time, our walk is supposed to line up with what the word is talking about. Now, Lord, help us. Can't do that in our own strength. Never will. Never will. Just get her done. Sorry, Dad, it don't work that way. That's what he used to say. I don't know if he talked like that. Larry, the cable guy, he didn't say get her done. But what he did say was pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And there was some good to what he said, you know. Sometimes nowadays we live in a society that's so soft. Come on, somebody help me out here. Amen. We live in a society that's so soft. You know, it's like, oh, the least little thing that hits us and we hardly can't even, we can't even get up from it. No, 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 no. Sometimes, sometimes you got to have some endurance and some steadfastness and some stick to itiveness. And you know what, Lord, whenever you mix that, when, listen, when you mix that with the endurance that God gives you, the strength that God gives you, hallelujah, man, you can walk. Yes. You can walk with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. That's what the apostle Paul was. You're not going to tell me that that little, I mean, I know the Bible describes him. He was probably small in stature. He, he didn't have much to look upon according to what the, some spots tell us. But boy, he, he sure was tough. And I do know, I do know that it was the Holy Spirit that gave him the strength that he needed. <laughs> but you're not going to convince me that that, that that old man wasn't tough. <laughs> I mean, after all the things that he went through. Anyway, that's another story. We don't need to get into all that. Let's look at this. Walking, okay, so, so we said walk worthy. Now, now this is sub point one. Walk with humility. Let's look at Ephesians chapter four, verse two. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. You know the word long suffering means patience in relationships. I love that word. It's, it's different than patience in circumstances. That's another word, hupomone, it describes remaining on. This is patience in relationships. But, not, but, but the word forbearing means to endure with someone in love. Now, one thing that we do need to get across here is that this is describing relationships in the body of Christ. <laughs> this isn't talking about your boyfriend or your girlfriend if they ain't serving the Lord. This isn't talking about your, 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 your aunts. I'm not saying that you should not be kind and long-suffering with family members if they're not serving the Lord. But this word is specifically speaking about people in the body of Christ. To treat one another with love. To forbear towards one another. Amen. To love and to endure with people in love. The, the child of God should treat even the even people in the world that way. But what I'm trying to say is, is that what this is talking about is it's specifically talking about the way you and I are supposed to treat one another. So that means if I did something to aggravate you at some point in time, you're supposed to forgive me. Same goes over here. If you did something to frustrate me, then guess what? I need to come to a place where I'm willing to forgive you. And guess what? You can't do that in your own strength. That's right. That's why it's called a fruit of the spirit. It's not a fruit of mad. It's not a fruit of, of anybody in here. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Next thing I, I wanted to say was, is uh, I put down here, walk on stable ground. And I had two little sub points under that. Walk on stable ground. First of all, you got to walk on the right foundation. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 through 22. It says, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. Can you see how you see how much the Bible repeats itself? You were in darkness. You were a stranger. You, you, you were a foreigner. This is all describing the first birth. This is all describing people born in sin, not being the people of God, not knowing the ways of God. But now you're a fellow citizen with the saints. 
and of the household of God, and you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Boy, that, that's a lot of stuff that's said right there, but it's some powerful stuff. You know that the cornerstone is kind of like the modern day version of a cement slab. A cornerstone was the foundation upon which the building was built. Jesus Christ is the foundation, the cornerstone, the foundation upon which God built his plan to save sinful man. The apostles and the prophets built upon this foundation. Amen. From there, the structure is built. God is building a structure, a place where his Holy Spirit, we already talked about it, sealed by the Spirit, where his Holy Spirit can live. A habitable place, a home, a house, a temple, amen, that's moving around, mobile like the Old Testament tabernacle in the wilderness, carrying around the presence of God, the Spirit of God on the inside. There's no other foundation that will stand the test of time. As citizens of God's kingdom, the aspects of our lives must be built upon this foundation alone or those parts of our lives will crumble into a heap of ruins. We must be reminded that if we do not build our house, every aspect of our life, I believe that with all my heart. If that's just too much hardcore preaching for you, oh, come on. Pre no, let me tell you something. Even though there's areas of my life and areas of each and every one of your lives that you don't allow to be built upon the foundation, I'm telling you right now, if we're not careful, those areas of our lives will crumble into a heap of ruins. It must be built upon the foundation which is Christ Jesus, because everything else is sinking sand. Amen. Nothing else is going to last. Walk in truth. Look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. We're talking about stable ground. That's the main point. Walking on the right foundation was the first sub point. Walking in truth is the next sub point. We're talking about a good, sure foundation. Look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachings Teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more, in other words, from this time moving forward, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, that's talking about deception of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. This is the part I really want you to see right here. We're talking about building a building, a habitation where the Holy Spirit can live. We talked about a foundation, which is Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And now upon this, God is building a, a, a building. He says the whole body, the, the body, Jesus, that's you and I. Amen. Are fitly joined together, compacted by which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself. And that's what the word edifying means. Uh, it, the word means to be built up. You ever been around some people that will tear you down? Mm -hmm. Right? And Lord knows I've done that before. You, I, we don't realize how powerful our words can be to tear other people down. Right? But the word edifying is the opposite. It means to be built up. So really what this idea of this word right here is being edifying is, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is building you up. He's building you into a building. Amen. He's building you into a structure where some things that he listed in this passage can take place. In order for a believer to be built on the foundation, which is Jesus, he will have to have a functional knowledge of the word. I'm talking about walking in the truth right now. Not to be tossed to and fro with every wind of false doctrine. Not to be confused and deceived by the slight of man. The slight of the hand. The little trick game. Remember, which one is the nut under? You know, which card is it? The slight of hand. Cunning craftiness of deception of men that would tell lies and not the truth. What language? I'll put this right here. What language did you grow up knowing? What I'm trying to say is, is that 
what I'm, the, the point that I'm trying to get across right now is that you and I have to become functional in the truth. Right. What, did, what language did, whatever, you, whatever your culture was, and I use that terminology loosely, whatever your culture was, there was a language connected to it. I don't mean to get all weird on everybody because I know it's kind of like I'm an unconventional preacher. I'm going to try to be careful that I don't go too far. But, you know, like in the drug culture, I hate to say it, but I was I was in that. But thank God I was saved out of that. They had all kind of terminology. You know, you cut you cut stuff, meaning you mix stuff to get, you know, uh, you know, nowadays I think that drug dealers call it a plug. You know, you got who's your plug? Where's the plug? You know, or whatever. You know, you got all these little words, you know, that are connected. It's like a whole different language. And what I'm trying to say is, is that there was a there was a language that we spoke before Christ. But if you're going to function on this earth, you're going to have to have a functional understanding of the truth. Because there's so much deception out there that's trying to throw you off as you're walking the walk, trying to put you in the wrong place. you got to learn how to walk in the truth. You have to have a, a knowledge of how the truth works. I remember when I was in nursing school, they're not going to just let you go give a, a, an IV push drug to somebody if you don't know. Like them nursing instructors, I hope they still do it now, but they're like, what are you about to go give? Uh, digoxin. Okay, I need to know what you expect that drug to do, and I need to know all the side effects. And if you couldn't list it off, you wouldn't go get the drug. Oh. And it makes sense because what you're going to do, you're going to go give a drug to somebody, you don't know what to expect as the results, you don't know what to expect as the side effects. And the reality of it is, is that if you and I don't have a working, functional knowledge of the Word of God, Listen to me. If you got an unteachable spirit, you'll never learn a working, functional knowledge of the Word of God. Because you can read all kinds of stuff. You can memorize all kinds of stuff. But that doesn't mean that you have the spirit and the intent of what God's heart was communicating in His Word. See, when you have a functional knowledge of the truth and you're walking, uh, you're, and you're walking according to that truth, then guess what? Some things are happening in your life. God has a plan of teaching his people about his truth so that they can properly be prepared to walk in his truth. He has given gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people. And the end result will be some things that were listed, perfecting of the saints. The word perfecting literally means to be brought to a place of maturity. I don't know about you, but I know I'm, I'm, like an, I'm, a, I'm getting to be old. But I think I'm finally starting to mature a little bit. I still just really don't want to grow up. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't want to. I don't want to get older. But but there, but there's a reality. It's happening. <laughs> but at the same time, you you can be you can be mature spiritually, amen, and still be young at heart. Praise God, right? But there, but I'm I'm glad that I'm starting to mature a little bit spiritually. I, you, we need to become mature spiritually, amen. amen. Also, an edifying takes place. A structure. That he can live in. Unity of the faith. Whenever we begin to learn the truth, God is bringing us all to a place. You know, the Apostle Paul said one time, he said, I wish or would that we would all speak the same thing. I know that when you look out there, there's a big old mess. I know that people talk about, oh, there's so many different denominations and, and these people believe that and those people. But can we all agree? Whether you're watching on camera, whether you're in here, can we all agree that there is one truth that God intended one truth to be told? And, the, and, the, and the, you know, Troy was sharing with me earlier. He said, man, the gospel is like a treasure. Amen. Mm -hmm. And it's our job as treasure hunters to find out what the Lord was saying to begin with. Amen. Not trying to pretend that we got the market cornered on truth. But what I'm trying to say is, is that we are supposed to dig and to search and to look until we find. Amen. Amen. God has one truth and he's wanting us all to come into the unity of the faith. And that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro. In other words, don't believe the wrong thing. And that the whole body would be jointly fitted together. You know what that means? That we're functioning as an organism and we're getting some work done for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. I mean, listen, I brought this up earlier, but I believe that that's how our church is supposed to function. There's a big difference between a big old church. Listen, I'm not fussing just about big churches. I'm trying to make a point. There's a big difference between a big old church that does all these community outreaches. 
and, and puts clothes on, gives clothes to people, and, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as we're giving them the gospel. Amen? Yes. Puts biscuits. I like the way one preacher said, you put a biscuit in their belly, but they're going to be hungry again tomorrow. Did you give them the gospel? It's good to feed the hungry. Jesus said it. You, when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. When did we do it to you? When you visited someone in prison. When you put clothes on the naked's back. When you put food in the hungry's belly. But the reality of it is, is that all of that is supposed to put the gospel. You're supposed to be putting the gospel in people. I, I don't mean to be overly critical, but there was this thing that was going on in the church where what you, it, was, it was based on that movie, Pay It Forward. And I can remember I went to go preach at a church. There was a year, I shared this with some of y'all before, a year where I got on the phone and I called all the people, all these preachers in the Assemblies of God, and I told them that they needed to come let me preach in their church. I got about 30 uh, people to end up hanging up on me. I got about 12 or 13 of them to let me come preach. But one of the, the churches I was preaching in was in Jennings. Or Crowley, one or the other. I can't Crowley. And while I was in there, they were talking about this new program they were starting. And what they were going to do was was that they were going to uh, when they went through the line at McDonald's, they was going to pay for the people's food behind them, kind of like behind that movie, pay it forward. And then they were going to give them a little, not even a scripture, from what I remember, it was just the name of their church. And and you know, I can remember they were saying that before I got up to preach. And I said, that, that, that's, real, that's real sweet, you know what I'm saying? When I, they didn't ask me to come back, but that's okay. Yeah, that's real sweet that we're doing something real kind for people that are behind us. But what I would hope is that I would be in line inside McDonald's. And the next thing you know, I'm over here telling somebody about the good news of Jesus. And the person behind me hears the story of the gospel. And they hear the truth and their life has changed. And you can be a big old church that's reaching out to the community and doing Easter egg hunts, which we don't promote. Easter egg hunts with the community. And doing this and doing that and doing all this busy work. Amen. But I believe that a church like ours, yes, I believe that will always be relatively small. But I think that the way that the gospel is supposed to work like it was in the book of Acts is that the disciples of Jesus Christ got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and took Jesus with them out into the world that they lived in, the world that they walked in, and shared Jesus with a lost and a dying world. And the people, it got contagious, hallelujah. and people received it, hallelujah, and they got saved. Right. And if that's what we do until the end, and we don't really grow in mass numbers over here. I'm not really that worried about that. And one, at one of the churches that I used to go to, I would always get so excited because I'd minister to people on a daily basis where I was at work. God would open up a door. I would be able to minister to someone and I'd come, I'd come to church. I'd say, hey, check this out. I, I, I led somebody to the Lord today. Or, oh yeah, we need to get you to move over here. Because the idea was, and I'm not fussing, I get it. We, As preachers, we want people to show up and sit in the pew. You know, it'd be kind of weird preaching to three people. You know, but, but, but the point was, is that they were, they were more concerned or they wished that I lived in the community because maybe in addition to, to be fair to that person, in addition to praying with people, I'd also invite them to church. Listen to me. I hope that the people that you talk to come to church, but if they never come to church, but yet at the same time you plant seeds of the they gospel, and right. their life is, never, life is never the same, I'm happy with that. Amen. We do the work of the kingdom. Praise God. I got to be careful. I don't overpreach this message. We're walking. We're not even going to get to stand, but let's at least finish walking. We're almost there. All right? Don't walk like the world. I put in here in parentheses, don't walk like an Egyptian. Back when I run in the 80s, whenever I was when I was hanging out, there was a group of girl, a girl band called the Bangles. I think a bangle is a bracelet that women wear sometimes, a bangle bracelet. Anyway, there, yeah, there was a group. Now, I think you're just going to show you how old I am. Y'all probably never even heard of the Bangles. But there was a song that they came out with. It was called Walk Like an Egyptian. And in their MTV video, they were they were doing this number here, walk like an Egyptian. Yeah, I'm saying don't walk like an Egyptian. Why? What are you talking about? Because Egyptian, Egypt was a type of the world. Don't walk like an Egyptian. Don't walk like the world. It says it right here. Don't walk in darkness. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. That you henceforth, in other words, from this time forward, walk not as other Gentiles walk. Gentiles. Y'all know, we, we've learned this in our church before. 
Gentiles were all the other nations that did not know God. They were the people that were in darkness that didn't know the ways of God. The Apostle Paul, these Ephesians were Gentiles before. They worshipped false gods. They worshipped a god called Diana. And what the Apostle Paul is saying, don't be like other Gentiles that are in darkness because that's not who you are. I'm writing to the church of Ephesus. I'm writing a letter to you. I know that's not who you are. I came to you. I preached the gospel to you. You received Jesus Christ. A church was planted. From this day moving forward, don't walk like they walk. In the vanity of their mind, meaning they have an empty mind. What are you talking about? They're empty of the things of God. They, they, they have their understanding darkened. They don't know the ways of God. They're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. People that don't know God, they don't know God. They don't know the ways of God. And so therefore they're walking like an Egyptian because they don't know any better. But the Apostle Paul is saying that sooner or later the gospel of Jesus Christ is supposed to turn into a different type of walk, a different way of living. Amen. A different look to us. See, before we were born again, we were like the rest of the world, walking in darkness, blind to the things of God. But now God has given us new life and access to his light. So we have been informed of what is right and wrong. And if we will sit, rest, trust in his power, we will also be able to walk in the light. Amen. I got just a couple more scriptures I want to share with you before I shut her down. All right. Because I want to finish this point. I only got two more scriptures. You ready? I put right here. The mind tells the body where to walk though. Many times the mind tells the body where to walk. Now listen, when we talk about the mind, that's just part of our inner man. That's part of our own enculturation. That's part of the, the, the what, what is dominating our life at this point in time. All right? Look what Ephesians 4, 22 and 23 says. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. That word conversation literally means lifestyle, way of living, the way that you used to live. The worldly way of living. The person that was born of Adam. The old man. You put him off. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's why you have to have a working knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Along with the Holy Spirit that you've been sealed with. Working in tandem. Teaching your mind the new culture. The new way of God. The truth that is found in Christ. Because once this new culture is implanted on the inside of you and your mind begins to operate according to this, now there's a clear pathway with a light shining on it. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It directs the child of God in the way that they should go. But sometimes a believer will still walk a dark path because he hasn't allowed God's word and ways to renew his mind. He prefers instead to allow the ways of the world that he's always known to direct his path. Anybody in here that won't admit that there's times that you, even a person that loves God, has found yourself traveling in a direction because you really, really didn't want to go in a different direction, you're not telling the truth. Each and every one of us. And, and sometimes, I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you, we don't like it whenever people tell us about it. Even though we know it's the truth. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. And that ain't, that's not my fault. There's been times, um, my friend John back there, I've had conversations, me and my friend John, there's so many times we've had conversations talking about the word of God, and I don't really, he probably don't even know, but there was different little things that he would say, well, you, you know, and, and he didn't even know it, but I was like, that irritated me. It irritated me because it was the truth. <laughs> and, and, and it was, a, and it, and it poked me in the eye. But I didn't sit there and start rubbing it. You know, I didn't want to let him know. But there's been times, and that's why the Bible talks about the fact that iron sharpens iron. Amen. Sometimes the word of God, we don't like the way it makes us feel because it convicts us in our heart. And we don't really want to let go. But, but, but the true child of God, he's going to have to learn how to surrender. Amen. Amen. To the ways of God. But the, but the mind wants to tell, tell us where to walk. The, uh, if we're operating according to the old conversation with the old man's mind instead of the renewed mind is going to continue to try to get us to go down the old pathway. But the new man with the new mind walks a new path. Ephesians 4 and 24. 
that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, the new path for the new man with the renewed mind is a path of righteousness. It's a path of holiness. This path doesn't lead to the same dark place as you used to go. I didn't get to standing. Standing describes separation. Standing describes separation in the midst of a fallen world that's full of evil and opposition. God wants his people to not just learn how to sit in Christ so they can receive the power that they need to live for him. Not only to walk with God so that the people around them will be able to know that there's a God of glory in the midst of a darkened world. But he also wants his people to be able to stand in the midst of a world that's full of evil opposition. Amen. 